Once upon a time in Formula 1. Imagine a small private Formula 1 engine building company could score podium finishes and even two pole positions while taking on the fight with the likes of BMW, Renault, Porsche, Ferrari and Honda. This is the story of Brian Hart, founder of Hart Racing Engines. In the mid 1970s, Brian Hart began to concentrate on building own designed Formula 2 engines, which powered race winning cars until the end of the decade. For 1981, Brian Hart designed an inline 4 cylinder 1.5 litre turbo engine named the 415T. This engine was used by the Toleman team in Formula 1. In 1982, the car-engine combination became more competitive and earned their first attention in the spotlights. Triumphantly on his way down through Paddock Bend and look at the performance of Derek Warwick. Ilio De Angelis is fourth and Derek Warwick is now up to fifth and Warwick goes neatly through, absolutely no trouble at all. A beautiful manoeuvre from young Derek Warwick, this is only his fifth Grand Prix. Derek Warwick is now very close to the battle for second place. We've got a three-car battle now. Didier Peroni in the Ferrari, Derek Daly in the Williams, and this man, Derek Warwick, only his fifth Grand Prix, remember, with the Tolman, a car that's had so many teething troubles, and through into Paddock Bend with once again no trouble at all goes Derek Warwick, Derek Warwick snatching third place from Derek Daly there and I think that took Derek Daly quite a bit by surprise. Now what a battle this is because Didier Peroni, one of the most experienced of the Grand Prix drivers, Peroni in fact now in his 69th Grand Prix, Derek Warwick in his fifth, Peroni with the whole might of the Ferrari team behind him, Derek Warwick with the much smaller and much less experienced Tolman team behind him. And look how close Derek Daly is to Peroni again. He's very, very close indeed. He's looking at one side than the other. They come up to Jochen Mass now. Will Jochen Mass hold one of them up? Jochen pulls to one side. The German pulls to one side in the march. Both of them go through. And that didn't seem to delay Derek Warwick one little tiny bit. Peroni on his way, Warwick on his way. Up the steep hill, done, and Warwick has a little look at the inside, but Peroni's too old a hand to let him get away with that. Peroni takes the apex, and this must surely be the day that has made Derek Warwick's name. And Warwick is tucked into the slipstream. Now surely must be his opportunity. Warwick is alongside into Paddock Bend. Derek Warwick goes through. Derek Warwick passes Didier Peroni with great ease. He just drove straight down the inside, a superb manoeuvre, and look how he's pulling away from the Ferrari. Warwick must be in trouble, I think. Peroni is up to him, Peroni goes through, Warwick's coming into the pits. Oh dear, oh dear, how very sad. Warwick's right arm raised, the car must have let him down again. How very, very sad indeed, because that was the drive of Derek Warwick's career. In 1983, the first points were scored with the Toleman Hart. After fourth place, in fifth place is Derek Warwick with the Candy Toleman. Can they score their first world championship points here in Holland? While teammate Bruno Giacomelli is not going to finish this race in the points. But the big news in fourth place, Derek Warwick scores the first world championship points for the Candy Toleman team. Ayrton Senna made his debut in Formula 1 with the Toleman Hart in 1984, and he managed to score three podiums that year. Due to the death of his father, as a result...
south of which Manfred Winkelhoff was most dramatically brought into the Brabham team. Bears out of trying, and Senna holding him off in the new distinctively liveried Tolman. Ayrton Senna, who finished second at Monaco in his first season of Grand Prix racing, now engaged in a wheel-to-wheel almost battle with Nicky Lauda for third position. The British built and powered Coleman Hart with his four-cylinder engine against Nicky Lauda and he's going through, is he? So as they go into that long looping turn six, Senna holds him off. Well, he certainly had a good long look. He really tried to get inside, but Senna managed to stay light on his brake pedal for long enough. But I think if Nicky can get into the right position as they come off the main straight, that's where he's going to do it with an outbreak at the end of the straight. And up at the front, the battle continues. This battle between Senna on the right in the Tolman, Lauda on the left, and they're battling for third position. Bill Prost first and Lauda, and, gonna, and Lauda is going through this time, surely. He's got the line, and yes, indeed, as they go into turn one, at the end of lap 33, Lauda is up into third place, only man more between him and his teammate Prost. And in fact, Lauda was way quicker than Senna. And young Ayrton Senna was already getting good at squirting the champagne. In 1985, the hard turbo engine managed to score a pole position at the Nürburgring. Qualifying provided a real surprise. Little Teo Fabi was fastest on Friday in the Tolman, ahead of Johansson's Ferrari. And on Saturday it rained, and that gave Tolman their first ever pole position and put Fabi into the history books. On the day of the race, Teo Fabi made a very bad start. Und äh, die große Überraschung war dieser Theo Fabi, der dominiert hat im Training und dann aber am Sonntagmorgen das Auto in die Leitplanke warf und mit dem Ersatzauto starten musste und jetzt auch ganz, ganz schlecht weggekommen ist. Gleich mal gut zehn Plätze verliert. Senna von 6 auf 1 vor Rosberg. Following the ban on turbocharged engines in Formula One after the 1988 season, Reinhardt's company concentrated on tuning Cossard V8 engines for a number of F1 teams between 1987 and 1991, including Footwork Arrows, Tyrol, Larus and AGS. This is not as bad as some, but uh, Amazi, of course, has got a fair bit of experience leading street circuit races last year in Formula 3000, namely at Poe and in Birmingham, Birmingham being a fairly similar circuit nature of circuit to this one and uh, that of course will be standing in, in very good stead now when he's being put under this intense pressure by Senna because believe me it's very difficult for somebody breathing down your neck especially somebody with the name and reputation of Senna in and, and McLaren and Senna has made it alongside he's won the corner and look at Alesi that's cheeky isn't it Senna was a little bit sloppy and, and Alesi's back in the lead fantastic stuff by Alesi tremendous opportunist driving for the 1993 season, Reinhardt built his own 3.5 litre V10 engine, named the 1035, signing a two-year deal with the Jordan team. Towards the end of the lap, and he's Zanardi making an outbreaking manoeuvre there. That would have slowed things down. He goes past Barrichello, and uh, Senna is now, well, he'll get the benefit of the toe from them. He'll be able to slipstream the slower cars ahead of him. They use their hole in the air, which will help him fend off Damon Hill, but Hill coming up quickly. Well, Senna holds, holds it, and Zanardi and Barrichello having a very big private battle of their own, and whoops! In Japan at Suzuka, Rubens Barrichello and Eddie Irvine managed to score the first points for the Jordan Hart combination but came under intense pressure for sixth place from Irving, who boldly unlapped himself from Senna's McLaren, which led to Senna thumping him after the race.
Levin clinched the final point of the afternoon by nudging Warwick's footwork out of sixth place. The following 1994 season was the most successful season for Brian Hart's engines in Formula 1, scoring 28 points with the Jordan team, Barrichello taking a podium finish at the Pacific Grand Prix and taking pole position at the Belgian Grand Prix at Spa-Francorchamps. Rubens Barrichello has shown his wet weather prowess in the past, most notably at Donington in 93. He too opts for slicks and goes fastest with a lap of 2 minutes 21.163. On Saturday there is no chance to run on slicks and Barrichello sits out the final qualifying session with his manager and the Jordan team. Alesi ends up fastest of the Saturday runners but he's four seconds shy of Barrichello's pole time. In the short run up to La Sorte's hairpin, Barrichello manages to hold the line and take the lead on the exit. Down to Eau Rouge, it's Schumacher second, fast starting in Lacey third and Hill fourth with Verstappen and Coulthard fifth and sixth. Into Lake Combe at the top of the hill, Schumacher out drags the Jordan and takes the lead around the outside. And by the end of the first lap, Barrichello is down to third. Third lap on the second set of tyres. Uh, you see the spin times 35.262 and only three tenths slower than Heinz Howard Frenson at that first intermediate. So if Barrichello can maintain his momentum, he's gotten through the worst of the slippery parts of the track. He's now making his way down into the Angel Nito duo of corners, here was where the wave yellow flag was, now up to Ayrton Senna, the chicane. With the introduction of the 3-litre formula in 1995, Brian Hart switched to a V8 engine named the A30, and these were used by the Arrows team in 1995 and 1996. <laughs> Delhi took a podium at the 1995 Australian Grand Prix. And so that took him another 17 seconds, and that's something that people often overlook. He's on his 62nd lap now. He's coming up behind Johnny Morbidelli to lap the fifth place man in the Arrows heart for the second time. And this will be an extremely heartening race for Brian Hart and all his men at Harlow in England. Brian Hart's men at Harlow did a very good V10 last year, a V8 this year. There are rumours that uh, they will get substantial backing from Asia next year for their engine, whatever it is. Let us hope that is true, because all that Brian Hart and his men need is the money to, to develop their engines. And Murray, the message from Barry Sheen down in the pits is to say that it was a crossed wheel nut, but everything's OK now. My, uh, my guesstimate was was right. That's what it looked. What that's what it looked like, and that's what it usually is when they put a wheel nut on and they have trouble in uh, getting it to run down the threads. I now I cannot remember when an arrows finished on the podium, but it looks as though it's going to because Johnny Morbidelli is third, Mark Blundell is fourth, Mika Salo is fifth, and Pedro Lamy may be scoring the first point for Minardi this year. Oh, Gianni, you can't do too much more of that now. You're well ahead of the fourth-place person, 
third place. The Arrows team are going to be absolutely delirious with this. And uh, Morbidelli's just got to take that car around. He's driven superbly. In fact, he's driven so well this year. And quite an underrated driver, in fact. And I'm delighted to see him get this result. And a tremendous tribute, of course, to Brian Hart's engine team in Harlow, who run on a fraction of the budget. A technical officer gets the cars organised in the park, Ferme. Look at Johnny Morbidelli, he's absolutely delighted. Fans plus the individual members of each of these teams on the podium cheering flags of every team of every nation. What a wonderful end to such a great venue for the Australian Grand Prix. Adelaide, we love you, we're sorry to leave, but you've given us 11 wonderful years of Grand Prix racing, and this one, I have to say, has been the best. The champagne shower then, and... Uh... Um, well, the basic thing is the packaging of the thing. And in a modern Formula One car with the current regulations, you need a low center of gravity engine, which is light. And the V angle really is dictated by the architecture of the driver behind the fuel tank with a fuel stock car. Yeah. So the engine is designed for the car or the car for the engine? Yeah, absolutely. Now, a Formula One engine runs for about 1,500 kilometers, maybe. Why is that? Because a road car... kilometers. Well, why 500? Because a road car runs for God knows how many. Well, you could, you could run more, uh, or you could run less. It's really dependent upon um, lots of factors in, in the engine at the time, you know. But uh, about 600 kilometers is the most that anybody gets before you rebuild it. You normally then have to change a variety of components, you know. A rebuild is taking how long? One day, two days? It takes about 90 hours, including a dynamometer test. And then the engine is fully checked before it even gets to the circuit? Yeah, every single one is dyno tested. Doesn't matter which manufacturer that is, you know, everybody does the same thing. Now, Formula One costs a lot of money, the engine budgets take a lot of the total budgets of a team. Um, would it be feasible for you to serve more than one team? Would you be able to do more development then on an engine? We, we could physically service more than one team, but we make, we make the decision voluntary to just stay with one team for lots of reasons. Um, most of them are obvious. I mean, practically, you're better off to service one team and you haven't got the other team in the other garage going, oh, they got the better engine and, 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 and all that business. Now, if you compare this to, um, let's say, uh, an average road car engine, uh, fuel consumption-wise and power-wise, how would you who rate those two? Well, this is a three-litre. I mean, if you compared it to your average two-litre family saloon, which is a little over 100 horsepower, 130 horsepower, so this is getting on for five times the horsepower, and it'll do around six miles per gallon. And it's very expensive. Yeah, yeah. Hij schakelt zijn eerste versnelling in. Op de torenbegrenzer van 13.800 toeren trekt Verstappen een rubberspoor van ongeveer een 75 meter. Vier jaar oud is en de technologie in de Formule 1 staat helemaal niet stil. Ieder jaar wordt er harder gereden. Worden er weer andere dingen ontdekt. En ook met Verstappen. Eerste vliegende ronde. Nadat hij bijna zeven minuten heeft stilgezaan is. 51.864. Goedemiddag. Nou, dat ronde record is hij kwijt. Jan. Voor 1997. Brian Hart joined forces with the Minardi team. This would be the last season for his V8 engine. Tarso Marquez qui, sauf erreur, euh, est équipé pour la première fois de la saison d'une caméra embarquée sur sa Minardi. Alors que très peu 
Deux pilotes euh, ont tourné depuis le début de cette séance, ce qui explique le peu d'images de caméras embarquées jusqu'à maintenant. Le kiosque 9, les données informatiques. For 1998, Brian Hart signed a deal with Tom Walkinshaw's Arrows to deliver his newly designed V10 engine, the Type 1030, but it was presented as the Arrows V10. The stunning Black Arrows A19, designed by John Barnard, is powered by its own engine, making the Tom Walkinshaw operation only the second team together with Ferrari to build its own power plant. We decided that instead of wasting the money just renting engines from someone, we would invest it and uh, build our own and hopefully get industry support for it. Slower than young Ralph. But let's remind ourselves that Mika Hakkinen may be denied that time, in which case David Coulthard, who was only one tenth of a second slower than him this morning, could move ahead and take pole position as we ride in the arrows. Down to turn four. He'll break about 100 metres before the corner, down into third. But notice the track falls away from you here. It's quite a tricky corner, actually. You have to wait much longer before you get on the throttle than you ever want to. There's a bump through here. You have to be careful you don't bottom out with the suspension. Into Ferradura, blind on the entry. This is the part I was telling you about. Now you can't see the exit until you pop over the top, and he's off. It's Deniz. It's Pedro Deniz. He's gone off. He's gone into, into the... It's not gravel. It's, it's a man-made aggregate, but it slowed him down. He's out of there. Yeah. Later that year, Tom Walkinshaw borrowed Brynard's engine company and merged it into his Eros Formula 1 team. Frustrated with the lack of development, Brynard left Eros, effectively ending his presence in Formula 1. 1999 would be the last year an engine designed and produced by Brynard would be used in Formula 1. The Eros Hard V10 would be replaced by a Supertech engine in 2000. To end this video, let's do a lap with Pedro de la Rosa, driving the Aeroshard V10 in 1999.